In August and September of this year, 2017, we witnessed three powerful hurricanes emerge in the Atlantic. These contributed to the most powerful hurricane season on record. The damage that these storms did to lives and livelihoods is staggering. Hurricane Harvey dumped 40 inches of rain in four days in parts of Texas. Hurricane Irma followed behind and with its powerful winds damaged nearly every building on some Caribbean islands and in parts of Florida. Behind that came Hurricane Maria, decimated Puerto Rico, wiping out the entire electricity system and most of the drinking water system for a population of three and a half million people. At the same time, we had wildfires burning in the Western United States, destroying thousands of homes. The costs estimated to um, repair uh, from these damages totals over $300 billion. Unfortunately, this is the new normal. Now, scientists have studied that uh, and determined that the sea levels are rising because of melting glaciers and a process called thermal expansion. As the warmer temperatures warm up the seas, they gain more volume. Higher seas yield to higher, yield higher storm surges during hurricanes, which results in more flooding. We also know that the air, surface, and water temperatures are increasing. Warmer air and warmer water give hurricanes more power, making them dump more rain and giving them powerful winds. Hurricane Irma gusts were recorded at 215 miles an hour. Climate change will impact all of us for the rest of our lives. Even if we stopped emitting uh, fossil fuels today, the emissions that we've pumped into the atmosphere so far will continue to generate uh, unprecedented warmth, unprecedented uh, increase in temperatures for decades, if not centuries, to come. Climate change is causing the decline of crop yields. It's causing the spread of many diseases beyond their normal range. It's contributing to our sixth mass extinction. It's contributing to an increase in both droughts and floods. It's causing a greater frequency of deadly heat waves. It's causing more violent conflict. It's even generating refugees. Collectively, we need to come up with some solutions. And as the leaders of the immediate future, how you think about climate change is going to determine what kind of solutions you imagine. So how do we think about climate change? One very prominent way is as an environmental issue. This makes sense. Climate change will alter our environment. Scientists conservatively estimate that the extinction rates that we've seen over the last 120 years should have taken between 800 and 10,000 years. And remember that extinction means that species is gone. And we're wiping out millions of years of biological evolutionary processes. Environmental organizations are concerned about climate change because of the potential loss of dominant species like polar bears, because of the potential loss of our coral reefs and the like. Organizations, prominent organizations like Greenpeace International, Friends of the Earth, 350.org and World Wildlife Fund are taking up the mantle of climate change. The other way that we can look at climate change, and why I think we often do, is, is as an economic issue. There's been a great deal of uh, economic research on the potential costs that climate change will have on our economy, as well as using economic tools to disincentivize our use of fossil fuels. Recent research predicts that climate change will cost the economy in the United States $1 billion a day within the coming decade. This is not centuries from now, this is within the coming decade. And that's half of our estimated economic growth. Others have uh, done research and projected that by the end of the century, our global GDP will be down 20% because of the cost of climate change. Uh, other uh, economists have developed tools like carbon taxes, 
and cap and trade systems to try and get us to use fewer fossil fuels. So again, climate change makes sense as an economic issue as well. The third very prominent way that we look at climate change is as an energy issue. Global warming and climate change are caused by the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas that we burn in our vehicles, in our homes, and in our production. So a lot of organizations are concerned about how do we change that? So they are developing and or lobbying for a switch to alternative fuels that use less carbon, burn less fossil fuels. So things like solar, wind, hydroelectric. Al Gore's Climate Reality Project and Elon Musk's Tesla are just a couple of examples of organizations that are working in one way or another from this perspective. My challenge to you today is in addition to those perspectives and underlying any perspective that you may have about climate change, we need to add the principles of justice. If you think about the principles of justice in their most basic sense, we think about fairness, we think about equal treatment before the law, and we think about holding people who are responsible for harming others. Uh, we, we want to hold them responsible for that behavior. Right? And we seek, uh, we seek justice through punishment like incarceration, uh, or maybe re the restitution uh, through fines for people who have caused others harm. Now, understanding the causes and consequences may make this justice perspective um, more evident. So, how do we look at the causes and consequences of climate change? Let's start with the causes. If we look at it as a singular global problem, as if we're all in this together, the problem is, is that that masks a lot of variation in the, the causes of climate change. So we can look at, look at it from a global perspective. And uh, greenhouse gases, which they're referred to as such because of their heat trapping ability, uh, carbon dioxide is the most prominent of a handful that are contributing to climate change. So if we look at the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, in this case from 1970 to 2012, we see a general trend of pretty continuous increase. However, uh, as a globe, we are still uh, a planet of relatively sovereign uh, and independent nations. So if we look at it from a national perspective, uh, again from 2014, again looking at carbon dioxide emissions, uh, we see some pretty clear patterns where China is the primary emitter of uh, the emissions that are causing climate change. Now the problem with that is that countries have greatly varying levels of uh, population. So if we look at it from a per capita emissions uh, rate, then we can adjust for that level of population. And again, we see a very different picture. In this case, the United States becomes uh, the prominent and primary emitter of CO2 responsible uh, for carbon dioxide. In fact, it takes two people from China, two people from Germany, two people from the UK, on average, to emit similar levels of emissions as a single person from the United States. It takes six people from Brazil, nine people from India, 13 people from Honduras to emit the similar level of emissions as the average single person in the United States. It takes 30 people from Kiribati, a small island nation that's predicted to be uh, submerged by rising sea levels to generate the same amount of emissions as a single person in the United States. 50 people from Kenya, 56 people from Nepal, the same amount of emissions as one person from the United States. So in many respects, the responsibility for the causes of climate change are becoming more clear. One last way that we can look at the causes um, is from a historical perspective. Because a lot of the warming that we're experiencing today is the result of emissions that were put into our atmosphere a decade, maybe even a century ago. Uh, many of the uh, CO2 and other gases linger for a long time. And so if we look from a historical perspective, from the history of industrialization, when we started burning fossil fuels, we see again that the United States is by far the most prominent single nation in contributing to the problem that we're all experiencing now uh, in climate change. Unfortunately, 
the consequences of climate change, despite these three very powerful hurricanes and the fires out west, the consequences of climate change are not distributed proportional to those who caused it. Because we're impacting the global atmosphere, the United States is the leading historical emitter and the leading per capita emitter, the consequences of that action spread beyond our own boundaries and beyond the impact on us. So instead, what we see is more impoverished countries, more impoverished communities, indigenous communities in our own uh, country being more vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. So when we think about increased frequency and strength of drought, here in the United States, our industrial agricultural system will develop drought resistant seeds, will tap into our uh, ability to irrigate our crops, and this will buffer us somewhat from the immediate consequences of climate change. A subsistence farmer in Malawi or a pastoralist Maasai community in southern Kenya that contributed almost nothing to the problem is they are already facing life-threatening life consequences of climate change and have few to no resources to deal with it. As sea level rise, as the seas rise, as the sea level rises, places like Wall Street in lower Manhattan and Miami, we will and are building billion dollar sea walls. We will uh, have extensive pumping systems. In, in parts of Miami Beach, they're raising the streets. So you walk out of a shop and the street is at this level now uh, to prevent already uh, frequent flooding. What about the 20 million people who live in relative poverty at or below sea level in southern Bangladesh? who do not have the resources to just get up and move, do not have the resources to build a billion dollar seawall to keep those rising seas from coming in. What about Kiribati and other island nations who as the sea levels rise, their cultures will have to disperse and struggle to survive? What about the indigenous communities in Alaska who are literally seeing their land erode away during winter storms due to uh, higher sea levels? and having to be moved to communities and lands that they are uh, unfamiliar with. What about during heat waves? We're gonna retreat to our air conditioning, which ironically further exacerbates climate change. We're gonna be able to avoid moving to the hottest places in our own country when they become intolerable. Southern Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. We're gonna be able to avoid moving to those places or those there, many of them will be able to move to cities of, with higher latitudes that are cooler, although some predict that by 2100, Chicago will have the temperature range of McAllen, Texas. Uh, others in other parts of the world will not have those resources. Others who have not contributed to the causes of climate change as we have will not have those resources to do, do such a thing. So if we can look at climate change from a justice perspective, this helps us to understand why developing nations are asking the United States and others to contribute billions of dollars to a fund to help them to adapt to climate change, to mitigate their own emissions uh, with using alternative sources of energy. This can help us understand why people are calling for the open transfer of technology to allow them and assist them in adapting uh, to climate change. Now, even the, the reduction of emissions is not equal. When we think about reducing our emissions, we've had well over 100 years of fossil fuel-based driven development that has led to relatively very, very comfortable lives and a level of consumption never seen before on this planet. And now we're asking other countries, when we talk about climate change being kind of a singular global issue, we're asking other countries to not follow that same path that we did, using those relatively cheap, very powerful fuels, and instead to pursue a path of development using uh, more ex currently more expensive and less widely available alternative sources. So while climate change is such a large issue that it will require collective, institutional, and even global action, what can you do as an individual? 
through this perspective? Well, I think first and foremost, we can think about what luxuries could we forego in order to assist somebody else who is, ha, doesn't have those same resources and is already feeling the impact of climate change. We can divest our own investments and ask our institutions like colleges and universities to divest their endowments from fossil fuel companies in order to stigmatize them and encourage society to switch alternative fuels. We can challenge ourselves to learn more about climate change. We can join social movements. My own, my own survey research uh, looking at large protest movements around climate change, the People's Climate March in 2014 in New York City and uh, one in DC earlier this spring shows that about 70% of the people in each of these protest events supported this, uh, this climate justice frame, supported this idea that the United States and other highly developed nations owe or should provide millions of dollars to help developing countries uh, overcome the challenges of climate change that we have caused. So with this justice perspective, I think we need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to hold ourselves responsible for uh, that which has benefited us. We need to uh, bring the conversation to any position that we have an opportunity to. You are the leaders of the immediate future in education, in business, in organizations, in all levels of government. You will be talking about climate change in, that, in those positions. I encourage you to bring this justice perspective to whatever those discussions are. I hope that you will uh, maintain a global perspective when you think about your consumption, when you think about our wealth, and when you think about your emissions. Thank you. <laughs>